Welcome back to Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. And a big thank you to my patrons on Patreon for your contributions to my channel. When we think of motions of the cervical spine, there's usually four that come to mind. Those are cervical flexion, cervical extension, cervical rotation, and then cervical lateral flexion, also called cervical side bending. But there's two other movements, and those are cervical protraction and cervical retraction. And that's what we're going to be talking about in this video. But before we do that, let's actually look more globally at this picture right here. This is a good demonstration of what we call upper cross syndrome. At the start of the video, when you saw me in front of my computer, that's a good example of upper cross posturing. Upper cross syndrome is caused by chronic positioning in that posture. So if I normally have great, fantastic military posture, and I just happen to kind of relax into this position for maybe a few minutes, and I come back out of it, am I going to end up with problems? No. This is a chronic posturing and the results of that. And so we really end up with four kind of regions right here that are tight, weak, tight, weak in a cross. Okay? The two regions of tight muscles are one down here, the pectorals. So generally the pectoralis major and minor are going to be tight in these individuals. And up here, the upper traps and levator scapulae are going to be tight as well. If you actually palpate the upper traps of somebody with this condition, upper cross syndrome, they're going to be really, really tight and probably will have some trigger points in them somewhere that you could potentially dry needle. In contrast, we have two regions of weak muscles. So here, the rhomboids, major and minor, middle and lower traps are weak, serratus anteriors also weak. Okay? And then up here, the deep neck flexors, they are also weak. Okay? We'll come back to some of these muscles in just a minute, but let's really define cervical protraction and retraction. You can just look at somebody maybe like this and figure out if they're protracted or retracted, but there's very specific things happening in the upper cervical spine and lower cervical spine. Remember how we define the upper cervical spine. So really the occiput, C1 the atlas, and C2 the axis, and the two joints in between them, the lano-occipital and lano-axial joints. That's the upper cervical spine. Every other joint and bone down here, all of this will be the lower cervical spine. So in this picture, the upper C-spine is kind of colored in this lighter tan and then darker tan for the lower cervical spine. When a person is in cervical protraction like this, notice that the lower cervical spine is actually relatively flexed and the upper cervical spine is in extension. Okay? How do we know if something's an extension or flexion? Well, in general, you look at the spinous processes. So when the spinous processes go further apart or they separate, that's really where you have flexion. Whereas if the spinous processes more approximate, or in other words, they come closer together, that's going to be extension. And that's true anywhere on the spine, cervical, thoracic, or lumbar. So for example, if you look right here, the spinous process of C2, that bifid spinous process, and what's actually the posterior tubercle of C1, remember it doesn't have a spinous process, they're much closer together than you see over here. So we know that in protraction, uh, the upper cervical spine is extended. And you can make the opposite argument for the lower cervical spine in flexion. In contrast, if you go into retraction, and you probably won't see someone just postured like this, this is more of an active movement, active retraction, the upper cervical spine is now flexed because we can see those spinous processes really and this posterior tubercle come further apart, whereas the lower cervical spine is now more extended. All those spinous processes are now approximated. Okay? Keep this in mind. Now over here in this picture, I've got a bunch of muscle groups represented by these blobs, but there's four major groups. We'll start by looking at the lower cervical flexors. This one's really just the sternocleidomastoid. Okay? The scalenes can probably help out a little bit, but sternocleidomastoid is the major lower cervical flexor. And then we have lower cervical extensors like splenius capitis, splenius cervicus. There's a few others in there like semispinalis cervicus, maybe some of the upper erector spiny muscles. The whole point is there's a bunch of lower cervical extensors. Okay? 
And then we have two very specific groups of muscles up here. These are extremely important. Okay, over here in blue on the anterior side of the neck, okay, these are anterior muscles, we have the upper cervical flexors. In general, we term these the deep neck flexors, and there's four of them. Rectus capitis anterior, rectus capitis lateralis, longus capitis, and longus colli. Four deep neck flexors. They're mainly responsible for flexion of the upper cervical spine. On the back side over here, we have the upper cervical extensors. These are termed the suboccipital muscles, and we have four of them as well. Rectus capitis posterior major, rectus capitis posterior minor, obliquus capitis superior, and obliquus capitis inferior. Okay, So suboccipital muscles on the back side, they're going to be extensors of the upper cervical spine, and the deep neck flexors on the anterior side, flexors of the upper cervical spine. That's important because remember that protraction posturing right here? What's happening in cervical protraction? We're getting relative extension of that upper cervical spine. So when you sit like this, kind of in that upper cross position like this in front of your computer, you may not think that you're using your suboccipital muscles, but you are. In order to maintain this upper cervical extension, those suboccipital muscles are working. Okay? And when you're chronically postured like this, not only do they work, they also get tight. So in general, for somebody with that upper cross syndrome, and in particular with cervical protraction, they tend to have tight suboccipital muscles. So all four of these muscles are going to be tight. Now in contrast, when you sit like this, you're actually elongating those deep neck flexors, and so they're not being used. They actually become weak. They're on the anterior side, remember. So all of those deep neck flexors right here, they become weak. So there's an important, important point. The suboccipital muscles get tight, and the deep neck flexors get weak with chronic posturing like this. So what's the major solution for that? Well, it's to practice active retraction. Now, you don't need to just always posture like this. In general, you probably want to be somewhere in between the two just normally. But we can strengthen the deep neck flexors by doing cervical retraction. Why? Because when we do cervical retraction, the upper cervical spine is going into flexion. That's the action of the deep neck flexors. This is how you strengthen the deep neck flexors is with cervical retraction. Okay? When you do that, though, uh, you actually are going to help lengthen the suboccipital muscles, right? And there's other stretches you could do of the suboccipital muscles as well. And you can get into some really specific exercises and stretches that we'll actually do in the next video. But the basic idea to fix this problem over here of tight suboccipitals and weak deep neck flexors is, well, strengthen the deep neck flexors and stretch the suboccipitals, right? It makes sense. If it's weak, strengthen it. If it's tight, loosen it. Now, how does this tie into cervicogenic headache? Well, remember, those suboccipital muscles and the deep neck flexors, they're around the occiput C1 and C2. Now, why is that important? Well, whenever you overuse the suboccipital muscles, it creates some microtrauma. Okay? The suboccipitals are small. They're just postural muscles, so they're endurance muscles. So you'd say, well, they should be able to handle this posturing, right? They're endurance muscles. Well, they're good at endurance, but they're not that good. So if you're always postured like this, eventually even the suboccipitals kind of start to run out of energy. And so you can end up with ischemia in that area for those muscles. You can end up with some local inflammation around the suboccipitals. Or you can even end up with trigger points in that area. And in general, that microtrauma is going to be localized between about C1 and C3, where it's also talking about nerve root levels. So areas innervated by nerve roots coming from C1 to C3. Now, I would argue you can also have pain in your head, right? That makes sense. You can have a headache, particularly on the top here or even in the occipital region. You can have headache, right? In order to have a headache, you have to have nerves that sense that stimulus, right? That goes to the brain and it, you perceive a headache. You perceive pain in the head. 
Now, why do I mention that? Well, there is a theoretical structure. It's not actually an anatomical structure. It's actually just described functionally, and it's called the trigeminocervical nucleus. Now, what's its significance? Well, it receives sensory information from areas that are sensed by C1 through C3 nerve roots, okay? So this area in the suboccipital region where you might have suboccipital ischemia, inflammation, trigger points, all of that nociceptive information is relayed through these C1 through C3 nerve roots into the trigeminal cervical nucleus, which is actually in the brainstem. That sensation from the head, so nociceptive information about headache, right? That also goes into the trigeminal cervical nucleus. So we have a convergence point. Nociceptive information from the head and nociceptive information from the suboccipital region, all going to the same spot in the brainstem, the trigeminal cervical nucleus. Then the trigeminal cervical nucleus from the brainstem relays that information to the brain. That's our nociceptive input. And we know the, the body doesn't perceive pain, the brain perceives pain. So the brain's gonna make a decision and it's gonna output potentially a headache. So how does a headache come from microtrauma in the suboccipital region? Because both of these regions send their sensory information to the same spot in the brainstem and also the, goes to the same part of the brain, sometimes the brain can confuse where the pain is actually coming from. It's not actually coming from the head, it's actually coming from the neck in the suboccipital region. But the brain basically gets confused. It says, well, you know what, I've got nociceptive information that's coming from C1 through C3, so I'm just gonna say, you know what, let's feel some pain. We'll put it right in the head, and that's your headache. Okay? That's the principle of referral. When you have two different regions that are ultimately sensed by the same part of the brain. And when you have a headache that's not caused by something in the head, but rather is caused by something in the neck, maybe the suboccipital region, that is a cervicogenic headache. Meaning that the headache is not caused by something intrinsic to the head, it's actually caused by maybe neck movements or prolonged posturing like this, particularly in that suboccipital region. Another important thing about the cervicogenic headache is that nociceptive information is coming specifically from nerve roots C1, C2, and C3, but not below. So if you have nociceptive information coming from C4 or C5, C6, C7, C8 nerve roots, it's not gonna cause a cervicogenic headache because those nerve roots don't transmit information through that trigeminocervical nucleus, okay? They'll still cause pain, but not in the head like this. Okay, so we're talking about upper cervical spine region. Things happening in there that are referring pain to the head because the head and the suboccipital kind of upper cervical spine region, they send that nociceptive input to the same part of the brain through the same pathway. In the next video, we're gonna be going over the cervicogenic headache in a lot more detail with emphasis on how to identify it and also um, some of the treatments that can be used to help it. But hopefully this video gave you a good understanding of what cervical protraction and retraction are, what muscles tend to get tight and weak, and how it could potentially cause a cervicogenic headache. Thanks for tuning in. Please like, subscribe, and check out my Instagram for cool science and not science stuff.